Cormac McCarthy fans, we are about to read some one-star reviews of Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses. And we are going to find out, for once and all, if we are the crazy ones or if they are the crazy ones. Because I think Cormac McCarthy is a literary genius. But I may be stuck in a cult, so let's see what the opposition has to say. Our first review of the day comes courtesy of Ellie at Ellie Examines on Goodreads and on BookTube. She hasn't posted in a couple years, so Ellie, I'm going to give you one last moment in the BookTube spotlight. So, starting Ellie's review, quote, You know how sometimes you read a book for school and spend hours discussing the brilliant symbolism of this scene and that scene, but then you get to the end and realize you didn't enjoy anything? about the book, that's what happened here. This is one of those books with brief symbolism that never builds to anything. Yes, there's symbolism, but it's all about the rugged West and the resilience of the masculine spirit, original. So we're already starting to see here a little bit of snootery and a little bit of quackery. Her bolded sentence that she wants us to examine is flawed because symbolism doesn't always have to build toward something. Not every text has to have a linear plot diagram that you learn in your creative writing class. And when it comes to symbolism, symbolism is never never original. Most stories in symbolism have been have been, been have been told and retold ad infinitum. It's the unique connections and play that you do with that symbolism that sets it apart. So we can see that Ellie is very turned off by the idea of the reg rugged West and the resilience of the masculine spirit. So Ellie has a philosophical problem with Cormac, but let's continue. Quote, I won't deny his prose is decent. McCarthy has some talent, is decent, has some talent for describing settings, although not nearly as much talent as the blurb seems to imply. V.E. Schwab has written setting descriptions 10 times better than this. Who cares, really? Especially, out, especially when everything else is so incredibly bad. So V.E. Schwab, everyone, is a young adult fantasy author, and I had to look her up and read some of her work, and I can guarantee you that she does not even come close to Cormac McCarthy, can't even exist in the same con on the same continent in terms of setting writing. Ellie is from Pennsylvania, if that's what it says on her profile. And no offense to all my Pennsylvanians out there. She doesn't understand the beauty and the depth of the desert and the Southwest. So we can also see that she thinks that a, a setting needs to be built. A set needs to be built. However, nature is not a set. And when you have a real relationship with nature, most of the time it is very minimal, like the Chinese poets talked about. And so when you're transmitting nature to the page, you're trying to bring it over as accurate as possible. You aren't building anything. You're trying to reduce the amount of beauty and data that is lost through the medium of language and writing. However, in fantasy novels, they build worlds. There's this all this world building. The greater out banks had this, this and that and you know, you guys know. And I love fantasy for doing that, but this is something totally different. So let's move on now to Ellie's critique of McCarthy's characterization. The quote, the main characters are incredibly flat and boring. This is my least favorite thing about classic books. Does John Grady Cole even have character traits? His one trait is stoic. Do we know anything about who he is as a person? Anything? So I don't want to be too hard on you, Ellie, but I think that you think the consensual reality that most of the Western world lives in right now is reality. If you go back even 50 or 60 years ago to South Texas, there were framings and perspectives of reality that would seem like an alien horror movie to you. For a long time, people didn't express express, excuse me, all of their emotions and make that a big thing. It wasn't until Proust and Rilke and even the boomer generation before emotional expression became this major thing. If you go look at photographs of people in the late 1800s and early 1900s, most of the time they weren't smiling and also they looked harder. They looked like some tough individuals because they were going through a lot. They were going through virus epidemics, wars, disease, not having penicillin, and a lot of time they were illiterate. However, does that make them worse for worse than us or do they have a different way of perceiving reality that's much more silent? And once again, we see this YA fantasy view. What are the character traits? Is this what is what what are what is literature? The WWE? That's what we talk about when we are doing something that's very gimmicky. Character traits don't matter as much as the embodiment of an energy. What energy? What purpose is John Grady Cole on? And Ellie seems to have totally missed this. She doesn't understand that vision of the nostalgic West of a time before technology, before there was a border war and politics, getting in an, an, a young man's way of an in, individuation. John Grady Cole and Billy Parham in the Crossham are going through individuation and they're actually on an arc 
it but however it is a negative arc but these traits aren't told outright it's not like john grady cole became much more angry he felt so angry at what his mother did they are accepting reality but that trauma and the energy that's coming upon them is influencing later decisions down the road i feel like john grady cole goes back and steals the horses for a second time to bring them back to texas just because of what happened in the prison he feels much more confident and he doesn't care anymore and speaking of character traits what is he he is a romantic he defies the orders of his boss and sleeps with Alejandra and he's out there with her. He is an adventurer. He is someone who is in love with horses, an animal lover, a man, or excuse me, a young man who has this miraculous ability to break horses. These things mean something to a mind that understands that reality. But for most people today, unfortunately, they are existing in a space that is very political, very self-identified, very technological. And these types of experiences and the silent nonverbal growth cues and languages don't make sense. Okay, enough on that. Let's go on to my favorite paragraph. I guess I should give this some praise for not being as racist as I expected. There's plenty of her dur Mexico is full of terrible brown people, but at least Alejandra is a somewhat 3D character. Still racist though. First of all, there is an elevation of Alejandra and her family. The grandma is a very nuanced and intellectual character. So is Alejandra's father and Alejandra. Everyone on the ranch is very nice to them. They are helped multiple times by family and people in Mexico. However, they, because of Jimmy Blevins, get involved with the dispute over a horse, blood is shed, and then they get wrapped up in a corrupted political town. I don't know. Once again, we have to go back to history and present reality. Are there groups of terrible people in Chihuahua, Mexico right now in northern Mexico. Are there terrible people everywhere in the world? Yes. Was Mexico in 1940 as economically evolved and politically evolved as the United States? No. Were there a lot of problems in northern Mexico because of the crazy violence we saw between the, the army uh, men scalping the Comanches and the Mexican army in the north and the, all the violence that that culture went through? I mean, for ad infinitum, but especially nearing the end of the 1800s. Have there not been multiple crazy revolutions in Mexico's history that has destabilized certain pockets of the country and created very violent individuals? All those are yeses. This could have taken place in Tennessee with some small corrupt town and police officer. However, it makes sense in Mexico where things are not utopian. They are worse than where they are coming from. There is more of a Wild West feel. So is that racist to depict a story about a bunch of people who have trouble with other people down in Mexico. And I don't want to bring it to the gross basic elements, people and people, but it's crazy now that any critique of anybody can be seen as some form of discrimination, even though it's a fictional novel. And people like her call for more plot, call for more action. There has to be an antagonist. And so what if the antagonist is of a certain race? There are plenty of antagonists in Cormac McCarthy novels that are white. So to conclude, Ellie's, basically McCarthy took decent prose and then threw in every single terrible thing about old Westerns, including racism, boredom, and flat characters, and then pretended it was a good book. All right, Ellie. Well, I've spent en- we've spent enough time with you, Ellie. I don't think you've convinced me, but let's read someone who I think has a very good review. So next we have Mr. Gregory Dukes. And I really like, I want to talk about the second paragraph right here because I think this is important. Quote, what annoys me is that it is so obvious in every way, in every way thematically. Let's describe an America pre-contemporary highway infrastructure, pre-major border control, a space through which one may travel on horseback in any direction one may choose. But then let's complexify that nostalgia with a double nostalgia by having our cartoonishly two-dimensional protagonist lust for the beauty of a bygone cow era, a bygone cowboy era. His dreams are destroyed by reality, and thus our own must be also collapsed in the face of various forms of beauty and evil found in McCarthy's constructed Tex-Mex world. So what? So what? I mean, it's so what? This is the most important thing that's ever happened to us. Most of us lived in past in a pastoral, nature-based community up until 100 years ago, our ancestry, that is. And to rip that all away and to put us into these little apartments and houses and never go outside and get fat and deal with all of this is a lot. And there are things because of the uber fast transition once again as i said about in ellie's review that have been lost and those things that have been lost are the solution to all the depression and to all the problems that are happening in society today or at least a lot of them however that structure has been ripped from us because we have been duped dopamine and the fast lifestyle and being rich and creating capital and like not having a homesteading act where you can get some land and work on it and try to survive have forced us to become lab rats have forced us to work continuously and think about it and grind out these really crazy weird goals 
But that old lifestyle is so is close to everything that was once dear to us. The American West and what America did at the end of an era was so exceptional in terms of philosophy and scope and what it created that dismissing dismissing it, in my opinion, means that you are harboring a lot of resentment about how it went down and how a lot of people have taken it today. Because obviously the ex exploitation of the indigenous people in North and South America by America and other colonial powers was brutal and done in terrible ways, and it could have been it could have been figured out a lot figured out with a lot less bloodshed and pain, obviously. And today, with what the culture has turned into of the westerns and this nostalgic west, and people driving around with big trucks and flags, that isn't this either. This was individuals out on the land who were literate and living in a place where they could be have the freedom of speech, religion, and to do what they want, to be able to travel into Mexico. It's about them experiencing reality. And when, they li when you live in the Southwest, I live in the Southwest, south of Tucson, right next to the border. When you are down here, there is a magical element. The desert is magical and the monsoonal desert, not the desert of Utah or Nevada or even New Mexico, a monsoonal desert in the Chihuahua and Sonoran region is an infinite landscape of expansion. And until you've spent a lot of time out here, you may not understand that McCarthy is playing off that double nostalgia and cracking it open into light. The pros, the horses, all these different things are really trying to take us back and understand what that all meant, what that small blip in history meant, and all the lost stories and voices from that. And you may say, well, we've heard enough of these, you know, these random white voices throughout history and throughout books. But this one, once again, is so important because it is the loss of all of us. In Europe, it had already been lost. In a lot of places, they had already been colonized and they didn't have the, the freedom to farm and to, to explore and to grow like we had in America. And so to see a modern mind, a modern kid in the 1940s touch that old world, it's amazing. So I, I don't think that Gregory Duke, how important that era is to all of humanity. Because to finish my point from a second ago, no matter what race, where you've come from, your people at some point lost the ability to do that. It's the same story every single time. Lost the ability to be free, to have to live on the land and to move freely and to think freely. At some point, all that was lost, and it was a tragic moment for everyone. And it was revitalized in America for seemingly the last time in history. So we can enjoy our prisons now. So our next beautiful one-star review, and they're getting better, everyone, don't worry, is by Lady Philosopher. If there is a quote, if there is a book and its later companions of the Border Trilogy that ever irritated me more, I cannot recall it. I work in the domain of trauma. Uh-oh, everyone. We all know what that means. So I'm even more aware of the issues at hand. This book crashes into violence, re-traumatizing all involved, re-traumatizing all, leaving healing as, impossible, as an impossible ambition. I could go on, but safe to say I have visited as bad in my life and in clinical settings with the people who come to unburden and heal. It's a long path for them, like this twisted set of words and works, but possession, honor, and all the patriarchal drivers only serve to show what a hollow, desperate life patriarchy has to offer. All right, so this is our first incursion now into the patriarchy of the Border Trilogy. So already there's in the inherent utopia here, listen, and all the patriarchal drivers only serve to show what a hollow, desperate, desperate life patriarchy has to offer. So when she throws patriarchy into this, which is, isn't required and isn't a good use, she's forcing this in. As we're about to see later in this review, it's very insane when people enter a review to try and find problems with it from a predetermined viewpoint, especially on the first read. Like, how is he treating women and the patriarchy and all of this? So we have the patriarchy on one side and then Lady Philosopher's utopian vision on the other side, which almost all of the time has something to do with socialism or Marxism. Quoting the review, then there is a laziness of the trope and, and the prose. The description of lust rising in him as she gl rides glacially by on her black stallion. Who says glacially? Hot and pulsating, so on and so forth, which continues in later books. The patriarchal female tirades in one tirade and the singer in, and singular in the paucity of women in the dialogue and when present are without agency. The elderly in Christian patriotic suffering. The rampant entitlement. It makes me sad that people enter books and think like this. When I imagine a young man reading All the Pretty Horses, I imagine them becoming more emotional and more contemplative and getting in touch with their own journey of individuation more and like really starting to contemplate that and move out and to maybe try to spend more time in nature and all these different things. That 
creates more nonviolent, compassionate human beings. I'm sorry, but most of the time reading creates more empathy and compassion. Sometimes in some situations, especially when it's forced by government, it can create the opposite. But most people self-educating move toward the light. There always has to be this person though. And of course, right here, she recommends other books. If you want to understand about trauma, you have to do this. And to finish up, quote, McCarthy's trilogy and, his, and this first book are almost devoid of oxygen. Respite and curiosity came in his landscape descriptions, but boringly were usually tainted by some horror to come. This and his, the, the two other books have nothing new to tell us, especially women. Nothing is offered us to aspire to, no depth to being. Most of all, this and they are not masterpieces. So is that what you want in literature? You're looking for a pick-me-up for women. I'm not looking for a pick-me-up for men. I'm not looking for anything. I am looking for masterpieces. I'm looking for an original story and depth, the real type of de depth. She says, no depth of being. Imagine people in the pharmaceutical age. People are championing these things, talking about depth, talking about understanding. You don't know what you don't know, I guess, but until you, I keep saying this, you need to spend time. If you spend a lot of time in nature, you will realize really fast how much you don't know, how much uh, society and a lot of these things are not, not important because in nature, there are no necessarily like hierarchical structures that are, cre you know, that are man-made or created. They just are kind of inherent and they are functioning. But we most of the time are at the top of that hierarchy as humans with conscious thinking and weapons and, and whatnot and can sit in it and contemplate it like the Taoists and like the Buddhists. And that's where real depth in life starts. Depth in life, you can never find any more depth within exterior philosophies and political groups and with saying more. Most of the time you need to say less and listen. Most of the time you need to be able to journal and express your emotions when you need to and then be on the internal, be looking into the infinite depth within. And a lot of time that depth has nothing once again to do with tangible reality. It's not something like, this is what I think. And uh, when I was eight years old, my dad said that I would never be a professional skier and it broke my heart. So now, you know, I got this ski tattoo right here and blah, you know, it, we Everything in reality doesn't have to function like that. But let's move on to another review. Thank you, Lady Philosopher. I don't think you've convinced me. So I guess you could say in conclusion that this is a very political novel, that it's seemingly that this brings up a lot of uh, people's emotions about mascu uh, toxic masculinity, sexism, the patriarchy, racism, all these different things. But I think I and you know that all of that is projections from their own consciousness and trauma. These pretty horses behind me, that, that Western wild feel is not a myth of male dominance and excellence. There were characters and there were people that did that because it was a very dominant mindset tethered to the domination of land and animals and all these other things. A lot of people were stepped on along the way. But as someone who understands where we're at and the path back to something even better than that, to earth-based consciousness, earth-based spirituality, moving away from the domination of all things, we have to go back through that. We have to go back through that freedom, loving, excuse me, that nature-loving time where both men and women could be who they want to be. Let me know what you guys think of all the pretty horses and some of the comments down below, and I will see you guys in another video soon on McCarthy.